not here, Mr. Fjellner. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you for your report. I think it, in many counts, is a very good report. I think the most important part of this exercise that we now are undertaking is actually to refrain from trying to draw new red lines. We already had a report where we pointed out the Parliament's position ahead of these negotiations. We have the mandate from the Council, and uh, we can't create not only a second, but a third mandate here with this report. So therefore, I think it's important that we don't do new lines, red lines. I, I just wonder how we would react if the U.S. Congress, in, during the course, in the middle of the negotiation, would start to deliberate and say, now we would like to move the goalpost somewhat and exclude things we earlier said we wanted to include, or vice versa. A lot of the debate on uh, this negotiation has been around the topic of, of investor-to-state dispute settlement. And uh, even though I know we're going to discuss it at length later today, uh, I must say that's one of the points where I think the report that you, Mr. Chairman, has, has drawn up ends up a little bit wrong, <laughs> where you say that it's not needed in practice. I, I, uh, if you would allow me, I would actually prefer to rather instead quote another German social democrat, Sigmar Gabriel, who I think pointed out it more correctly when saying that we need on ISDS investment protection for a new generation, and actually views this as instead an opportunity, a chance for Europe to set the gold standard globally for new investment protection. And I think that we should and I don't say this often, so please listen carefully. We should listen to this German social democrat, because I think he has an important point to bring forward. I have with great interest read the, the, uh, the S&D group's position paper uh, that I think uh, that you presented on, on ISDS, and, and I think it was a very interesting one. I, I've tried to understand what the socialist group's position is on this topic, I'm not a criminologist, so I'm not, I don't understand all of it. But if I read it correctly, you say you don't want ISDS, but at the end you list many good ways one could reform it, and I interpret it as you could live with ISDS if one would reform it. I think that is a wise position, uh, and I hope that will be the position of the Parliament as well. But at the same time, I think too much of that paper and too much of this report and too much of the debate in this committee has been on how the courts should function or whether we should have courts at all instead of having a debate on the substance, the material aspects of investment protection. What kind of investment protection do we want courts to protect? And what kind of investments don't we want courts to protect? Because I think we as legislators should focus on the laws rather than the courts. And that is something I will try to do in my amendments. For example, what is fair and equitable treatment? How should we define it? How do we want to define it? Indirect expro expropriation. What is indirect? What do we view as indirect expropriation? And, and do we need different levels of protection for different types of investments? And I honestly think we could agree on those important material questions of investment protection. If we got past the debate, do we want the court or don't we want the court? The only aspect in this report where I actually see an attempt to discuss the material aspect sadly, is one that I don't agree with. And that's the question where, where you point out that you don't want protection, you only want protection for post-investment, uh, post-establishment investments. And, and I don't, I hope that's not the view of the committee. I'm not even sure that's the view of, 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 uh, of the socialist group. Because in, if that would be the case, then it would be okay to discriminate as long as you haven't already done the investment to say that, oh, we only allow investments from American companies, but it's okay, because you haven't established yet, because you were never allowed to establish if you have the provision of only post-establishment protection. 
So that's something, and I can't find that in the mandate either. So that's what I believe is the new red line. Uh, the second area I think is very important and interesting is, is services, and uh, Ms. Arena referred to that as well. I think the most important thing is not rather probably positive or negative list. The most important thing for me is that this is future-proof, that this don't exclude new services, because this sector, especially in the digital area, is somewhere where we can't imagine services that will come. So only referring to a positive list, saying that this is the only thing that will be covered, will actually make this obsolete, because then new services can't be covered. Uh, we spend a lot of time, sadly, in the debate around TTIP, being afraid of what we might agree <laughs> with the Americans around. I, I think we should focus a little bit on what we want to agree around and where we actually should push the Commission where we are afraid we don't make enough progress or effort. And for me, that is especially the question about the digital ecosystem, the data flows, so on and so forth. Uh, because that is, of course, crucial not only for digital services, the internet economy, also normal economy, industrial companies. And, and here, I think it's bad to point out and say that we can't make commitment in this area before we have the data protection legislation in place. We always have ongoing legislation in all areas in Brussels. And to limit our ambitions and say that we shouldn't make commitments because we have ongoing processes would just make us handicapped and impossible to actually get ambitious agreements. So that's also something I would like to, to address with amendments later on. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. So